Hi, you're watching TechCrunch TV. My name is Colleen Taylor. Joining us via Skype to discuss the National Security Agency's alleged data mining of uh, major internet companies, we're very pleased to have Dr. Gene Stafford, who is a professor of computer science and electrical engineering and computer engineering at Purdue University and a well-known computer security expert who has worked uh, with the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee and has a long list of credentials that make him an expert in this field. And so thank you so much, Dr. Spafford, or can I call you Spaff? Sure, that's fine. <laughs> Dr. Spafford, for, for coming and joining us here. I just want to kick off with the question that everyone seems to be asking is that we're seeing from the Washington Post and these leaked slides about the NSA and the PRISM program and now with the denials from the internet companies that have been implicated in these slides saying that there's absolutely no direct access to their servers that they're providing and in fact they haven't heard about the PRISM program at all until yesterday when we all heard about it. Uh, who's right here? Does this mean that somebody's lying? Well, there are a number of different possibilities that could explain what we've seen and what we've heard. And certainly one of those is that uh, PRISM, or whatever it may be uh, described in those slides, doesn't exist. Uh, we don't know where those slides came from. They look like they might be authentic. And uh, personnel at The Guardian newspaper and The Washington Post have said that they have verified them. But uh, it's a question of how did they verify something that is supposed to be uh, top secret, uh, limited access information. So that's one possibility. Uh, a second possibility is that when the uh, spokespeople have been interviewed about this program, uh, they may be under strict court order not to reveal anything about its existence and could face significant penalties if they were to verify that such a system existed. Uh, keep in mind that interviews with the press are uh, not under oath and so they might be in a position to lie, uh, especially if there were significant penalties. A third possibility is that whatever program that exists, that they may be a part of, uh, may be named something else or not even have a name. And so when they say they've never heard of PRISM, they could be telling the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there could be some other thing they're aware of. Fourth possibility is that whoever's responding to the questions simply is telling the truth and doesn't know that such a program exists. Uh, certainly if such a program were in place, only a small number of people would know about it. And it's also uh, possibly the case that the words they're using in their denials are, are carefully chosen uh, so that what they're denying uh, is true and that whatever is going on, if something is going on, uh, would, would take on a different form. All of this is very difficult to analyze because we, aren't, we don't have access to the details. We don't know. And... In some sense, if the program exists in some form, uh, the purpose for which it's being used, which is to track uh, potential terrorists, uh, possibly espionage, possibly organized crime, uh, these are things that they don't want to divulge the details because that would wreck the effectiveness of the program, uh, something that may have taken years and many millions of dollars to put into place. So. It's one of those things that we may not ever really know what the answer is. But there are a number of explanations other than outright lying. Right. Which one do you personally think is true? Um, I imagine that there is some legal method for law enforcement in different countries to gain access to data held by social media. Uh, corporations to you gain access to email and ISPs. Uh, that's the kind of thing that law enforcement has been doing for many years, being able to get the appropriate court orders and to go to those companies uh, makes a lot of sense. And there isn't a reason for those companies not to cooperate with those orders. Right. 
to do something on the scale that's alleged is possible. Um, I I really don't know what to believe. I, I, I tend to, to question whether or not that would be done. Uh, these corporations are international in scope. They're not U.S. And to be involved in something like that could put their personnel at risk in other countries, could hurt their business models. And the officials I've talked to at a number of multinationals are extremely sensitive uh, to not appear uh, exhibiting undue favoritism to the U.S. or to any other country uh, for fear of its damage to their, their personnel and their corporation. So if, even if they're a U.S.-based company like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, all these companies implicated are, uh, if they were giving this access to the U.S. government and not to the U.K. government, then that would be a big problem. Well, wherever their customer base might be. Uh, so, for instance, Facebook does have a very significant presence in North America, but they also have a very significant presence in Europe and in parts of Asia. Uh, so it, it's difficult to say they're a U.S. company. They're an international company with a significant presence in the U.S. And maybe it started in the U.S., but as a corporation, uh, they operate in many countries and are responsible to many different jurisdictions. So that really complicates issues of law enforcement, corporate governance, and, and a lot of these other related issues. And one phrase that has been copied in almost every CEO's explanation about this, from Mark Zuckerberg to Larry Page, is the phrase direct access. We have not been giving the NSA or any government direct access to our servers and our server data. Is that legalese? Is that some type of phrase that could be used to get around the fact that they are giving some kind of access to the government? I mean, how, how typical in your experience would that be? Um, if, if a law enforcement agent were to have a warrant for access to an email account and were to take it to one of these companies, personnel at those companies would retrieve the information and provide it to the law enforcement agent. That's indirect access. Mm. So if you were to have an executive say, we don't provide access to law enforcement, that would clearly be uh, uh, untrue. Saying that we don't provide direct access is saying that we don't provide a connection where they can directly go in and look at the data. And uh, that's been alleged in some sense by people who've looked at one of these purported slides and said, oh, look, they've been They've been given access to all of these servers. Well, that's what I find hard to believe, and I think that's what's being denied by these executives. Right. So what is there a possibility? One one theory that has been bandied about on the internet a bit is that, you know, Google or Microsoft or Apple could be copying their own data and providing it to the NSA so that the burden of copying is on Google or Yahoo, and so that way they're not providing direct access to the information, but they are providing all of the information nevertheless. How, how big of a scope would that be? How possible is that? Considering the volume of data that is held by those organizations, to be copying that would be uh, a huge burden in time, in energy, in equipment, in media, that certainly seems unlikely um, because they would have to be doing that on a very large scale and many of their employees would have to know about it. It would have to be, uh, it would show up in any kind of engineering calculation for the amount of infrastructure that they have in place. It isn't impossible. But again, it, it would seem to be very unlikely. And in the slides that have leaked, it says that this program, PRISM, only costs the NSA something like $20 million. So it seems like if the burden isn't quite following on these companies, if it were following instead on the government, is $20 million an accurate amount of money to, to pay for this kind of scope? 
one would be very hard pressed to even build a data center for $20 million, let alone at government rates. Uh, th this is one reason actually to doubt some of the veracity of those slides. Uh, any program that's only in the tens of millions uh, would seem to be unlikely for an agency like uh, the NSA. Uh, so what do you think is happening then here? I mean, is it much ado about nothing? Um, I, well, I don't know. I, I have no access to the information. I don't know what's actually going on. Uh, I think there are, there are several things here that are interesting about this. Uh, the first is, in the last three days, we've seen three highly classified bits of information that were at the center of stories broken by The Guardian in England, all involving highly classified U.S. documents. Um, that indicates that there is potentially some very significant leak of someone who's violating their oath, who's disclosing information that's protected by law, um, and is undoubtedly going to be raising the ire of law enforcement, intelligence, government agents throughout the U.S. Uh, because they don't know what else may be leaked. This is a major problem and is likely to provoke a significant backlash. Um, it raises some questions about the veracity of that information. Um, I find the timing interesting that all of this is being released on the days that the president is meeting with the Chinese premier and a major topic of that discussion was supposed to be the U.S. complaining about surveillance and cyber attacks <laughs> by the Chinese. Uh. Um, one of the one of the things in security uh, is that there are no coincidences, and so one can't help but wonder if there isn't some political motive. Uh, who's really behind this? If in fact this was uh, a real story, I, I don't know, uh, but but it does make me wonder. Uh, what does come out of this? However, the, the Verizon story, this story, uh, is a reminder how much our technology enables for data collection and analysis about our private lives. It reminds us about how much we have allowed to happen as a response to terrorism with things like the Patriot Act in the U.S. here. Uh, and that so much of this has occurred without any real public debate about the nature of privacy. Uh, what is our privacy worth? And, and even so, it's a little bit ironic, I think, that I've seen so much discussion about privacy on Twitter and Facebook and blogs where people post pictures of themselves and their personal information and, and uh, their location information, and they're complaining about privacy invasion. Uh, so we, we have a number of things here that need to be discussed, and perhaps this is something that we can use as an entree to begin that discussion. I see. So people are voluntarily giving up this information, but they, they volunteer to give up what they volunteer to give up. And I suppose the, the real feeling of intrusion here is that, that, it, is that it's a secret thing, or allegedly a secret thing. Yes, and, and it's interesting. Um, People have said, well, we don't know who's getting the information. Well, they have no idea when they're posting it online either who's getting that information. Uh, they say that they're only sharing with their friends. Well, again, posting online in public fora goes to a much larger audience. Um, there, are, there are all of these, these arguments back and forth which sort of display a fundamental lack of understanding of what the technology is capable of. Uh, what information is actually out there, and also a little bit about the trade-offs between security and privacy that officials have been making, uh, assuming that that's what the public wants. Uh, we have, as a populace, been very vocal about our concern about terrorism, even though it is an extraordinarily unlikely uh, kind of event and we seem to have been willing to give up an awful lot of information for a very tiny about, uh, amount of extra security. Uh, for example, suppose that this system exists as described. Didn't stop the Boston Marathon bombing, did it? Right. 
Yeah, that's a very good point. And my last question here is that you've, we could go on for a long time and it's such a pleasure to have you here, but I just want to ask, uh, you've talked in the past about how we don't really have a lot of tech savvy people in our government, in Congress, or at the higher levels of elected office. Uh, do you think that there's a disconnect here? Is, is this finally, these kinds of news stories, could we spur more people to get involved with the government? I mean, how do you see this larger trend? I would hope that more people would get involved from the tech community in politics, um, at least in having dialogue with our decision makers. Uh, we see a tremendous lack of tech technological understanding, scientific understanding, exhibited by many candidates, uh, some who attack issues of genetic research, vaccines, uh, um, some of the issues about global climate change. Um, they deny the science behind many of these issues. Uh, and information technology, we see a certain lack of awareness. Uh, one senator was quoted as saying, why are people so upset? It's just metadata, uh, which, which indicates a, a lack of knowledge about how metadata can be used to reveal as much or more than what would be in a conversation. And so we, we do need to increase the amount of technological awareness. Doesn't necessarily mean we have to have computer scientists and engineers uh, running for Congress, although that might not be a bad thing, but we do have to improve our dialogue with them. Right, agreed. Well, with that, uh, Dr. Eugene Spafford, thank you for joining us from Purdue, and I'm sure that we'll keep in touch here. It seems like a changing story. It does. Thank you, Colleen. It was my pleasure.